would turn with me in your Bibles to the book of James. Just for a few moments this morning, there's a typographical error in the program. It's James 19, not 9. You might be, might be good on your part. You don't need to add extra verses. <laughs> James chapter 1, verse 19 through verse 27 would be our unit of thought for this morning. When you have it, please stand for the reading of the Word of God, the Gospel of James, the letter that James wrote to the, to the people there, chapter 1, verse 19. Everyone standing with your Bibles open as we read. And verse 19 says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let not, not every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. Wherefore, lay, up, lay apart all filthiness of superfluities of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your souls. But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened to a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway immediately forget what manner of man he was. But whoso look into the perfect law of liberty and continue therein, he being not a forget, be forgetful, a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. If any man among you seem to be religious and brighteth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. Verse 27 said, True religion and undefiled before God. And the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Father God, we pause just to thank you again for your grace and your mercy. We, we thank you, Father God, just for waking us up this morning and, and starting us on our way. We thank you for being here this morning, that we, we're in the number just one more time. We come now this morning not with pride, not with our chest stuck out, but we come now realizing that we only hear by your grace and by your mercy, Father God. So we thank you and we, we praise you just for sending your son to down an old rugged cross that we may have right to the tree of life. So Father God, we just thank you now as we come to the point of the service where we break the bread of life. I just pray now that you would lift me up into your storehouse of wisdom that you would anoint me from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. You would give me preaching power from on high that I can preach this sermon with power and with clarity. Like John said, let me not decrease while you increase, that they always hear from you and never from me. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. God bless you and thank you and you may be seated. In the presence of the Lord, I want to talk this morning from the subject, doers of the word. Doers of the word. And if you were asked, Americans, are they saved? The majority of the people would tell you, yes, I'm saved. Yes, I'm born again. Yes, I am a believer. But many people deceive themselves thinking that they are saved when they're not. Simply because of works that they do, maybe the money that they put in the offering or the position that they hold, maybe because their grandmother or grandfather is saved and they've been going to church all their life. And for some reason, they think based on something that they've done that they're saved. But it saddens me with this, that many true believers are, are fooling themselves concerning their Christian walk. They are spiritual. They think they're spiritual just because maybe they post a scripture here, just because they show up on Sunday morning, and just because you got a Bible engraved with your, your name on it, just because you sing in the choir. They're fooling themselves into thinking that they're spiritual, and they're fooling themselves based on their Christian walk. They think they're spiritual just because, really, they're not spiritual. Just because they attend church and Bible study occasionally read their Bible, that they're spiritual. One must not be a hearer of the word only, 
but one must be obedient to the word of God. James is saying to them, it's not, it's not enough just to sit in church on Sunday morning and hear the word. We must be obedient to what we hear. Many of us come to church and we walk away and forget that we've ever been to church. Too many people are hearers and not doers of the word. Many believe that all they have to do is attend church and listen to what the pastor has to say. But obedience and surrender and sacrifice is totally disregarded. We sit here on Sunday morning and hear us preach and teach the word of God. And, and many folks just walk out of disregard the fact that we are to be obedient to the word of God. As we think on the subject, doers of the word, I want us to notice three things this morning. First of all, the proper reception of the word detail. Secondly, the public reaction of the word described. And thirdly, is the profound reality of the word uh, defined. Them. But notice point number one, the reception of the word detail. The Bible says when the word goes forth, it shall return, not void. That the word is going to accomplish exactly what it what it set out to do. So when we preach the word with power and with clarity, but we also must remember that when the word goes forth, the word must settle on good ground. You know, when you decide you want to plant a harvest, you till the ground. You turn the ground upside down, you fertilize it, you get it prepared when you lay the seeds. You don't walk out there and just take the seeds and throw them on the ground. On a hard soil that is not broken. It's the way our heart has to be. When we come to church, we must be ready to hear the word of God. Yeah. And this ought to start at home. When we're at home, we ought to start that preparation of getting our hearts ready, getting our, our soul ready so we don't have to come to church dead as a rock and the praise team have to catch us on fire so we can get on fire for the Lord. But what happened when the praise team don't catch you on fire? Then what? Yeah. You ought to bring that fire with you. It ought to be that preparation at home. So when the word goes forth, your heart is tender and is ready to receive the word of God. Just like in the book of Acts with the Ethiopian eunuch. As he went, the eunuch heart was already ready to receive the word of God. All Philip had to do was preach the word. And our hearts ought to be ready. That's why it's so important to be obedient to the word of God. But notice the command that's revealed there in verse 19. And it says, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. That word wherefore, put a period there. We have to stop and look what went wherefore or what went therefore. What was just said? He's simply going back and talk about, well, what Jesus said, we're never tempted. He'll never tempt us to do evil. That all good things come from God. Whenever you see wherefore, you got to stop there and look what just was said. It's like a connection. It's a connector there. So what he was talking about previously was about temptation. God will never tempt us to do evil. Now, if you're tempted to do, e to do evil, that is not of God. That is of the devil. Amen. And all good and perfect gifts come from from the Lord on high. But notice he said brethren. That means to believers. He commanded them to do three things. Now if you want to receive the word of God. Listen there's three things you must do. First of all. If you're taking those write this, write this down. To be swift to hear. Quick to listen to the word of God. Now if you want to receive the word. You got to be swift to hear. Quick to listen to the word of God. This is especially important in the first uh, century with the believers because they didn't have Bibles. They didn't have the New King James Version and the King James Version of the Bible with the with the thumb index and the red letters in it. So everything they heard it was oral. So they had to listen and they had to remember what was said. So it's vital that we hear uh, the word of God. Faith coming by hearing and hearing coming by the word of God. It should be our desire as believers to hear the word of God. And Paul Peter says it's like the, the sincere milk of the word. You ever had a baby and the baby was hungry and the baby would constantly cry and cry until the baby's fed. That should be our desire to hear the word of God. Just like a new baby desired the sincere milk, uh, we should have that same desire as believers. We should want to hear the word of God. We should want to read our Bible. We should want to listen to, to sermon Psalms. One say we ought to meditate on the word day and night. People are focused on everything but the word of God. And if you want to tell 
where a person's heart is. It should be the old saying, but look at that checkbook. Look at that credit, their credit report. If you want to know where their heart is, our heart ought to be on the word of God. Our, our mindset and everything that we do, we ought to have that desire to hear the word of God. You have so many preachers today have altered the word of God. They're no longer preaching and teaching what thus said the word of God. Now it's health and wealth and naming and claiming. Now it's the grace moving, but there is no preaching on the word of God. Many have faltered and failed and, and turned to the side like Paul said to vain jangling. They want 20 minutes of sermon and, and about three hours of service. See, one guy told me, he said, our bus can only handle about 20 minutes of preaching. But you can sit there for two hours of singing, four hours of a football game, three hours in a hairdresser. But yet when it comes to preaching, I can only absorb 20 minutes. First of all, we need to be swift to hear, but secondly, we need to be slow to speak. That means not to be quick to speak. Think about what you want to say before you say it. Because once you say it, you can't take it back. Especially when we're angry. We need to be careful about what we say. Now the motive of the, the, the words when we're angry is like a knife. It's a dagger we're trying to uh, get back at them. But once we settle down and calm down, then we regret what we say. See, listen, we got to be slow uh, uh, to speak. God has given us two ears in one mouth. Have you ever thought about that? Why do we have two ears in one mouth? Then we listen twice as much <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> James is not telling us that we should take a vow of silence, nor does he mean that we are to bar any reaction of, the, of a Bible study or a lesson, but what he's calling us to do is plain old common sense, the principle of thinking before we speak. So we are to listen. Now you can't listen and talk at the same time. And oftentimes we open our mouth just long enough to change feet. A lot of us find ourselves in this predicament with, with, with our tongues that we can't control, our tongues that we quick to, to speak, but also he says slow to wrath. That means don't get angry with God about his word. Many times we have heard the preacher preach and sometimes it's stick our nerves up, and we spend the rest of the sermon stewing over one point. You know, the pastor said something that's done pricked our hearts, and, you know, now we, we're convicted, and now we're sitting there upset and mad with the pastor because of something that he said, and oftentimes anger is a disguise we put on conviction. Once the pastor says something, and now you're convicted, you get mad, and that, who is he to tell me? How I ought to run my life. Who he think he is. That's just the sky of you being convicted. And now you're getting angry with the word of God. Like he said, don't get. I think it was Samuel said, they're not mad with you. They're mad with God. No, you're not mad with me. So you get mad all you want. You're mad with God because it's God's word. I'm simply just telling you what God told me to tell you. But he said you got to be slow to wrath. you got to be slow to, to get angry, when, especially when it's dealing with. With the word of God. Amen. That disguise of conviction. The Lord is telling James to tell the people to control their tendency to fly off the handle. And let, and let God's word get deep down into their, to their soul. And work out the things that are hidden under their super sensitive feelings. We ought to let the word that we hear get down and penetrate. Even into that area where we're very sensitive you know, that's why a lot of folks get mad and don't want to come to church. It's because they don't want to hear what the pastor has to say. They know that it's going to bring about a conviction, and they don't want to be convicted. Just like David, when the prophet gave him the parable, talked about there was a man that stole this man's little ewe lamb. And the only one he had. This man had plenty of lamb, but this man had only one little ewe lamb, and he stole his lamb. And David said, who is that man? I put him to death. And the prophet says, you. You that man. The one that stole his ewe lamb. But the word ought to uh, get internalized on the inside of us. Listen, that, that it might change us from the inside out, even those areas where we are sensitive and we don't want anybody to say anything about it. If we want to receive the word, we got to be swift to hear, 
slow to speak and slow to wrath, but not only the command that's, that's revealed, but notice the caution there received in verse 20. And it says, for God, here's because, here's the reason, because the wrath of man worketh not righteousness of God. This means man's anger and indignation does not produce God's righteousness. When we get mad, we get an attitude, we fly off the handle, I guarantee you, you do not do anything that's godly. He said when we get mad and we fly off the handle, that which we do does not bring glory to God, that which is right or God honoring. Like Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitfully wicked above all things, and who may know it? It's the tendency is not to incline us to keep the law, but to break the law, and it does not incline us to embrace the truth, but it's totally the opposite. When we get mad, our words are, I show him. I show her. I show them. I can do what I want to do. When we get mad, it does not produce godly righteousness. God told Moses to speak to the rock. Guess what? Moses got mad with God, and not only he didn't speak to the rock, but he struck the rock two times, and for that, he lost his place inside uh, of the land of, of Canaan. Jonah was told to go to Nineveh and preach the message to the Ninevites, but Jonah got mad. And Jonah ran from God, found himself in the belly of the well. He's cautioning us to tell us that when we get angry and we fly off the handle, it does not produce anything that is godly. But notice the conviction that's revealed, required there in verse 21. It says, Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluities of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. If we receive the word of God and it's rooted in our hearts, we will do well. See, when the word is heard, it's internalized, it's understood, we'll begin to get rid of the more filth and the evil that is prevalent in our lives. The word of God on the inside of us with the Holy Spirit ought to bring about a conviction on the inside of us that we ought to try to live moral, right, lies before God. We ought to humbly accept the word that is planted in you which can save all of us. But there's barriers, James says, that not only for the hearing of the word of God, but there's also barriers in accepting the word of God. See, when we're saved, we're new creatures. All things pass away. All things become new. The Holy Spirit that indwells in us should bring about a conviction of our wrongdoings. But see, there's a problem. There's a problem with receiving the word of God. First of all, notice number one thing, upon the, uh, the conviction required, number one, here, herein lies the problem. The fact that an immoral lifestyle produces a barrier to accepting the word of God. If we are in an immoral, ungodly lifestyle, it puts a barrier between you and the word of God. See, everybody understands it, even the sinners. Those that are in an ungodly lifestyle, there's a barrier to accepting the word of God or the gospel. It's no secret to anyone, even good church folks as well. Living with sin in your life grieves the Holy Spirit. And it leads us to trying to make excuses for our problems. Once we get convicted, of our lifestyle, we begin to make excuses as to why we're doing what we're doing. God understands my heart. God knows that he understands. He, he made me this way. It's not no fault of mine. I couldn't help myself. I couldn't resist. Or We begin to make excuses. But when we have an ungodly lifestyle, it puts a barrier uh, uh, between you and receiving the word of God. In other words, you say, I, I don't want to, to come to church because I don't want to hear the word of God. When you have sin in your life, it's not favorable of receiving the word of God. Because I don't want to hear what that pastor has to say. 
I know these don't say. I know what I'm doing wrong. I, you start making excuses as to why. Light and darkness cannot abide in the same house. But one of the problems that hinder us from really receiving the word is the fact of an ungodly, uh, immoral lifestyle. But notice there's also uh, pride there as well. James says that we must humbly accept the word of God. We must admit before God that, that we cannot ever be good enough to make it into his presence. We on our own, based on our own merits, will never be good enough to make it into the presence of Almighty God. We must simply rest on his grace, on the price that he paid on Calvary for our sin. We must accept the word of God, and we need to put away pride. They say pride is always before the fall of the engrafted word, the gospel we receive as truth is planted in us like a seed, and it must grow and produce fruit. Now, a lot of us say we're Christians, and, and I've said this throughout the years. I don't have a heaven nor a hell to put anybody in. If you say that's between you, you and God, but the Bible says you know a tree by the fruit that it bears. Because if you don't bear any fruit, you can't tell what type of tree you are. And also, the Bible says a good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit, and you're just like the tree or the fruit that you bear. Yeah. So we have to be careful about pride. When we're Christians, we ought to be able to prove that we are Christians by the fruit that we bear. Some people trust in their own good life uh, to get them to heaven, but he said we ought to depend on the, the engrafted word. We ought to depend on the word of God that which is able to save us and we not save ourselves. It's prideful people that say, well, listen, I'm good enough. You know, I can do enough work. I can pedal that back enough. I can knock on enough door, sell enough bean pies in order to do such good works that I'm in the presence of Almighty God. That's a prideful state. He said we ought to put away pride, we ought to put away any ungodly, immoral lifestyle that is before us. How can you come to church and then you continue to go home and you have an ungodly lifestyle? We're not talking about slipping into sin. I'm talking about on a day-by-day -day basis, this will provide, this will cause a chasm between you and the Word of God. But not only the problem, that's pride, but notice there is the power. It says that which will save you is the power unto salvation. Romans 1.16 says that the Word of God is the power unto salvation. For the grace of God that brings salvation to all men have appeared to all men. Whomsoever will may come. This is the word of God that will provide salvation for whomsoever will receive this word. Amen. None was excluded from the offer that the provisions were made for all people that all might be saved. All might become to the knowledge of the saving faith of God. This is the power to salvation. Now it baffles me because if the gospel is the power to salvation, why don't people preach the gospel? Why is it that we're preaching all of these other rhetorics or, or the psycho babble that you hear, but we're no longer preaching the undulterated word of holy God? It is the power unto salvation, which is the gospel. It's the good news. We're talking about doers of the word. We looked at the reception of the word detail, but notice the public reaction of the word that's described. Not only must we receive the word, but we must apply the word to our life. It's not enough just to sit in church, just to listen to a sermon that I'm preaching if you're not going to allow the word to get internalized on the inside of you, and you're going to be doers of what you hear. Amen. James is talking to the ones now that, that just simply hear the word, but they're not doers of the word to illustrate the difference between those that merely hear and those that are hearers and doers, James used the illustration of a man looking into a mirror. But notice the condemnation according to him in verse 22. And it says, but, there's a redirection of thought. And it says, but ye doers of the word and not hearers only deceive your own selves. For if any man be a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass, the word of God here is presented as a mirror to show us what we really look like. 
Now, if you want to know what you really look like, it's not for me to compare myself to Deacon Swanson or, or Minister Byrne. If I want to know what I really look like, I compare myself to the Word of God. I take the Word of God, put it up against my, my life. It's like a mirror to me to show me what I really look like. Amen. Without a mirror, you can deceive your own self into thinking that you look good. If you don't look, or, or if you're looking in the wrong mirror, I can compare myself to somebody else. And I can say, well, you know what? I'm really not a bad person compared to this person. But if I pick this person, I, I look like a wretch undone. But we usually would pick a person that's lower than us to make ourselves look good. But without a mirror, without the word of God, we can't tell how we really look. So James used the mirror as an illustration of the Bible, but notice the deception there. He addressed the ones that are hearers and not doers of the word. Many folks today sit in church Sunday after Sunday, hear the word, and never heed to what's said. Those that just sit and listen to the word with no obedience to the word of God. In other words, like mom and them used to say, it go in one ear and out the other. I just told you a minute ago. In one ear and out the other. I think that's what happens many times with church goers and, and church folk. They hear the word, they go in, and by the time they get to the parking lot, it's the went out the other side of the ear. But now he's talking about those that are hearers only. But notice the deception. It says, but, is a redirection of thought, but keep on doing and not hearing only. The ones that hear only are deceiving their own selves. That you sit in church and you're not here. You, that's a, it's bad when somebody else deceives you. But when you deceive your own self, that's worse. That you sit in church and you hear the word. You know right from wrong, but yet you still won't do it. You keep on doing uh, just keep on hearing and not doing. The scripture says, why call me Lord, Lord, if you're not going to keep my commandments? They think they're spiritual, but they're really not. Those are the ones that run around in the church, levitate over the building, jump over the pew. Those that have they posted on Facebook, those that names on the road of the prominent churches. You think that you're spiritual just because your name is on the church that has more than 20,000 members? They think they're spiritual. But the ones that are spiritual are the ones that hear the word and do the word. Ones that hear and do. Not just sit here and hear the word and not do what the word says. But the dilemma here is the hearers are like a man who sees himself in the mirror and walks away and forget what he looks like. How many of you ever done that? You know, you can look at yourself in the mirror, you walk away, you still can remember what you look like. Because either you, you go say, well, I look good or... I look bad, you're not, normally I'm jacked up, but yet you go about your business anyway. The righteous man will look in the mirror, and he'll look in the mirror, look at the word, and he'll act upon what he sees. When you look in the mirror, and you're jacked up, you tend to change what's wrong. If your hair is not combed, your track is falling out, your tie is crooked, your jacket is on wrong, you're not going to walk away from the mirror and say, oh, don't worry about it. No, you're going to correct What's wrong? The mirror, the word of God gives us the image of, of the problems that we have. It's just like a man that looks in the mirror. If you see anything wrong before you walk out of that room, you're going to correct it. Yeah. Same way it is with the word of God. When it brings about that conviction, when something is wrong, we ought to be the one that changed what is wrong in our lives. He said, like a man beholds himself in the mirror knowing he's messed up and simply just walk away and just forget about it. Out of sight, out of mind. You just walk away and don't change. If I want to look in the mirror and I find that my hair is not comb, I'm just not going to come to church. I'm going to correct that. You know, if your tie is crooked, you know, my button is button up wrong. If I look at myself, kind of line myself up and make sure I look I look decent and, I, and I'm ready to go. And that's the way it all, that's the way it should be with the word of God. It should show us how we really look. And if something is wrong, we ought to correct it. Very simple. But notice the comfort that is received there. Verse 25. And it says, but, remember that's a redirection of thought. But whoso look into the perfect law of liberty and continues therein, him being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the works, this man 
shall, future tense with the promise, be blessed in his deeds. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives liberty and continues to do this, not forgetting what he hears, but doing it shall be blessed. If you want to be blessed of the Lord, it takes obedience to the word of God. Amen. Many of our lives are jacked up simply because we're not obedient to the word. We don't do what thus said the word of God. But the Bible says those that look into the, the law of liberty, the perfect law uh, of liberty, this man shall be blessed in his deeds. That means whatsoever he does, he shall be blessed. Let me read one verse to you. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8 if you're taking notes. And it says in this book of the law, shall not depart out of the mouth, but shall meditate day in and night, and 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 thou mayest observe to do accordingly to all that is written therein. For, here's the reason, then shall thy way be prosperous, and then shall thou have good success. After the prerequisite is to be obedient to the word of God, not to be just hearers of the word, but you must be hearers and doers of of his, his holy word, the law of grace that talks about the perfect law of liberty. Here is the standard for us that we look into the perfect law that gives us freedom and gives us sin control. We have control over sin. Once we said yes to Jesus Christ, the Roman text says that the Holy Spirit comes on the inside of us and now we have power over sin. Sin is no longer a uh, have dominion over me. I'm no longer a slave to sin when I have Jesus Christ on the inside of me. I can say no to sin. I don't have to sin like I did when I was in the world. But if you want to have that uh, 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 blessing of God, you must be obedient to the word of, of God. We're no longer under the penalty of sin. James says, if you want, if you're doers of the word, you must do two things. There's commitment and there's correction. First of all, the commitment is you must be committed to studying the word of God. You must be committed to reading the Bible. You must be committed to being in Sunday school and Bible study and Sunday morning worship and reading the, reading the word of God. You must be committed. You must be surrendered to the word of God. Then there is correction. Secondly, you must make the necessary changes. When you find something is wrong, just like a man when he looks in the mirror, when you see something wrong, when you look at the word of God, it ought to be that correction that we ought to change what is wrong. Maybe it's your time, your talent, your treasure. Maybe it's your commitment. Maybe it's your worship. Maybe it's your witness. Maybe it's your tithing. Maybe it's your giving. But whatever is wrong in your life, when you come up against the word of God, you ought to make the right correction to be in line with the word of God. I think he did a good job. I would have never thought of that of using a mirror. Which shows us how we really look and use the illustration of the word of God as a mirror to show us how we really look. But not only the reception of the word detailed, the reaction of the word described, but notice the profound reality of the word defined there. And I put this disclaimer out, and I know everybody knows this, but just to say it anyway, but everybody isn't saved. I don't care if they're in the pulpit or in the pews. Everybody that show up on Sunday morning is not blood-bought and Bible-saved. Maybe you can tell real religion by the size of their Bibles or the cross around their necks, I can't. Maybe you can tell by some of the words they use and whether or not they're slain in the spirit in 7-Eleven, or they say different terminology to let you know that they're religious. I can't tell that way. But we must let the word show forth in our lives. It says, does a man hide a light under a bushel? Does he hide his candle under the bed? The Bible says, let your light so shine. We should not hide what we believe. If we believe the word of God, we ought to make a stand with the backbone and a spine in that which we believe. You better believe the atheists. You better believe the ungodly people. They're making a stand for what they believe. You know, the, the homosexuals that come out the closet and we went in the closet and cut the light out. They're making their, 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 their presence known 
And we as believers ought to also make a stand. For what does the word of God say? Vice what they say. Forget about all of that. What does God say about an issue? We should not ever, ever hide our light under a bush or under a bed because I'm afraid because I don't want to uh, shake it up. I, you know, I don't want the, no ripples and I don't want to bring no attention to myself. In order for us to have a pure religion, we must do the following. There's three things that I'm, I'm close. To have a life that honors God, we must do three things. But notice, first of all, the control that's required. Look at verse 26. If any man among you seem to be religious and bridled not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is faith. That word vain means empty, uh, avoid, notice the control that's required. And being religious, that saying and doing, we show our external observation. Listen, in public worship, in church attendance, in prayer, and fasting. But if you cannot control your tongue, you deceive your own self. James talks a lot. He gives a whole uh, chapter just about the tongue that is the smallest member, but it is full of deadly venom. This is the last, I believe, the last of all that it is to take us to get under control is the tongue. The tongue is an awful thing. It's a small member, but yet it's full of venomous uh, uh, deception. But he's simply saying now, you come to church, you can do all that, you pray fast, put all your money in, in the offering, but if you can't control your tongue, you deceive your own self. Our words reveal whether we're good or bad or what kind of person we are is by our words. Out of the, the heart speak of man. Out of, out of the abundance of, of our heart we speak. All you got to do is talk to somebody long enough, you can find out what they love. Amen. Just talk to them long enough. Because what's on the inside of them surely shall come out of them. But our words reveal whether we're good or bad or what kind of person we are on the inside. It's not profanity that reveals our worthlessness of religion. According to James, as much as negative, critical, condemning, gossiping tongue that he spotlights with the poisonous effect of grumbling, complaining, quarreling, and slanderous talk. He said, this is what? That proves that our religion is not pure. When we're grumbling and complaining and, and gossiping and backbiting, this is the evidence of a phony faith, one that cannot control their tongue. So a lot of folks probably all maybe all get out of shape now. Remember what remember about getting mad. Don't get, don't get mad. I'd be slow to wrath. Don't get mad, because you're not mad with me, because you got to get mad with God. you got to take it up with him. But it brings about a conviction, and on that disguise is an attitude. But I believe when we're able to control our tongue, that's at the highest level of our Christian walk with God. I believe that that's the last one. And once we can control that tongue, then we will be at a high level of religiosity. I don't even know if that's a word or not. But if, if it is, if not, well, I just coined a new word. Put that one in the dictionary. Long, on, on the side of a uh, selfie. It's not a word. Control required, but notice the compassion that's revealed, verse 27. And it says, the pure religion and undefiled before God and, and the Father is this that we visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. The compassion that's revealed, James uses the concern of the need of widows and orphans because, for an example, simply because in those days they had no one to care for them but the church. Now, if you were married and your husband passed away, you were in, you were in, you were in pretty bad shape. If the church didn't take care of you, and you was in bad shape. That's where we get the oldest profession from. Because when she was there, she had no, she had to do what she had to do. But listen, he used this as one example of how real religion acts. He never forgets about those that are in need and those that cannot help themselves. This is a reason how you show how you show that your your religion is pure, that your Christianity is right, your life is right, that we never forget about those who can't help themselves. 
We never forget about those that are in need. The orphans and the widows had no means of support other than the church. And also those who are sick and those that are bereaved, those that have lost someone in their life. See, we ought to have compassion. But we ought to be able to look back and say, God had compassion on me. See, I was lost on my way to a devil's hell, and God sent his son to die on the cross while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. It ought to be that compassion that we can share for someone else. I may not be all that I should be, but I'm glad I'm better than what I used to be. Amen. That God had compassion on us, that he sent his son to die on the cross for us. We ought to have that compassion that we can extend, extend to others that are hurting, others that, that are in need, others that, that, that need help, those that are sick, we can go by and visit them, that, that are bereaved of loved one. Maybe they lost someone in the family. We ought to be there to comfort them, to pray with them, to console them in their time of need and trouble. This is one of the proof that we have a pure religion. First of all, we have that we go and that we are concerned about others and that we're able to control what we say. But notice lastly, our, our conduct in the latter portion of verse 27. And it says, and, it's a conjunction to what we just said, and to keep himself unspotted from the world. At times, religious folks are being polluted by the world with such things as movie, television shows, hanging with the wrong crowd, going to the wrong places. These can certainly qualify as sources of moral and spiritual pollution. Be not conformed to this world and this world ideologies, this world's uh, uh, disposition. We're not to be conformed to what the world loves because the Bible says if you love the world, you're an enemy to me, to God. So we ought not to love the world or the things that's in the world, but we ought to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. We do well to teach our children that, listen, to remind them that, that, that evil companions do corrupt good manners. And that simply means you can have a good child. Let your good child hang around the wrong child. Or a bad child. That bad child can corrupt your child. So we have to be careful about who our children hang around with, where they go. We ought to have that conduct in our lives that it is unspotted, that the world cannot lay claim or blame to anything that we, that we do. We ought to have a life that is pleasing to God. We shouldn't have a life where everybody can lay claim with Pastor Edward did this, or Pastor Edward did that, or he did this, I saw him doing this, I saw him going there. I did, I, you know, that shouldn't be our claim. You know, if they want to find something, they got to search deep and hard. Or maybe they're going to have to go back at least 13, 14, 17 years. You know, you go back then and folks try to dig up something, but you, want to you won't find nothing now. And you're going to have to dig deep uh, try to, that's the way our lives ought to be. It ought to be where people just can't look at us and say, oh, he's no good, that's sorry, preacher. He, uh, he, everybody had their eyes closed, he was stealing the money out of the offering tree. <laughs> I know y'all heard that one. That's, that's a true one there. That should be our case. As believers, we ought to be the example, not the exception to the rule. When people see our lives, it ought to be a reflection of God. They ought to be able to see us and say, you know what? I want my life to be just like that. I want my life to be like Pastor Sister Sheryl. I want my life to be like that. You know, I want to have a life that's pleasing to God. When we look at some of the believers, you'd be saying, wow, boy, if that's a Christian, I don't want no parts of that. But that shouldn't be our story. We should uphold God's standards. Like they say in the old days, the blood stained banner. What we should uphold in our lives should let God be glorified in what we do. Whatever they say, they say, I don't know what's going on over there, blessed hope of God. Well, they changed that person, but I got to go over there and find out what's going on. That's the way it should be. We ought to hear the word. Let the word penetrate, internalize on the inside of us that our lives are reflected of the Christ that's on the inside of us. So when people see us, they'll see Christ on the inside of us. And that will give them a thirst, a hunger,
before the word. And I know one of our members are here today, and I know she might, she don't probably don't care if I share this, but she's here. Sister Sherry is here because of someone else. She saw something in them that changed, and she said, well, let me go see who or what made this person the hottest. But see, that's the kind of hunger and thirst our lives are to produce to those on the outside. They say, well, listen, I need to go see what's going on. Not the opposite. But I say this and I close. It's not enough to be heroes only. And I can't, if I, the serious as I can be is, is that I am now. That we not only be heroes only, but we be doers of the word. And we don't waste our time. Just I know you guys don't come and just enjoy listening to me talk. That can't be the case. That you just want to listen. You come here because you just like listening to me talk. I don't think that's the case. But let's not waste our time by just being hearers and not doers of the word. God holds us responsible for what we hear and what we do. And one day we all will stand. Before that beam of seat, that the judgment seat of God, and we must give an explanation of all that we've done in the body since we've been saved. I don't know if God's going to ask the question how it's going to work, but you're going to give an account of all that you've done in the body. And God may ask you why. You've been in church 27, 30, why? You're going to have to answer. But my last thought, let this stick with you. And you don't have to raise your hand and say amen or oh me. Are you a hearer or are you a doer of the word? Now, if you say I'm a hearer only, I would suggest that this day, today, you make it your business not only to be hearers, but also to be doers, to be obedient to what thus says the word of God in order for God to bless you. God says, I will withhold no good thing for him that walk upright before me. All that is supposed to be coming to me I want all my blessings. Yeah. Sometimes we hinder our own blessings because we are disobedient. But when we align ourselves up with the word of God, that which we pray in God's will, we shall receive. But when we are align with the word of God, when we come to church and we're here only, and we're not doers of the word, we hinder our own blessing. Are you a hearer or are you a doer of the word? Everyone stand.